really, I mean, when I think about my my business and my work now and so forth, I mean, it's so <laughs> I've got to say, it's so planned, Michael. I have, you know, for me to be able to do all the amazing, wonderful variety of things I do, what struck me then was, yeah, I've got um I've, I have a big A4 file effects diary. I still like the traditional, you know, physical paper stuff. But that's that's interesting. It's it's a, there's a lot of planned stuff in there. Mandy, who you just heard from there, says that she has to plan a lot of the things in her life now. But she also spoke to me about all the things she did when she was younger, and most of it wasn't actually planned. She just allowed it to happen. So which camp are you in? Are you the planning variety? Or are you the allowing variety? This is a really great interview with Mandy, hearing her story, how she ended up in running her own coaching business, and much more besides. I know you are going to really enjoy this interview. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Mandy. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. Really, really well. Just uh, met with two of my other lovely coaching colleagues. Um, we're creating some uh, fabulous work together at the moment. So, yeah, I've just had a, had a meeting with them this morning. Great. Sounds exciting. Tell me all about it later. <laughs> I will. <laughs> so I'm going to start off with the first question that I ask all my guests that come on the podcast. And thank you so much for coming. I really love having you on. Um, so my first question is, tell us a little bit about your personal life to begin with. So where were you born? Uh, if you moved around the country, where did you settle? A bit about your education, your schooling, and then we'll move into your like first job and stuff like that. Yeah. So over cool. to you, Mandy. Thank you. And yes, thank you for uh, for your time as well. Um, so I was born and to be fair, I've lived for most of my um, life in Birmingham. Um, I was actually born in um, a hospital in Marsden Green, so my mum told me. Right. <laughs> Um, and grew up in, um, there was a, a flat that we lived in when I was really tiny, up to about the age of four, which I remember very well. I remember this flat with its seven stories high and we were right near the top. Mm. I remember power cuts and I remember, um, cause I was the eldest of three and I remember my mum trudging up the stairs with, uh, the, the pram. Um, when we had the power cuts on um yeah and um my my dad at the time used to play football on um sort of senley's uh, park it's called yeah and, uh, and i just remember having this memory when i was little of looking out through this little kitchen window then there were like ants playing on the grass wow. i just remember i don't know if i could really see him but i have this memory of <laughs> seen these tiny little ants playing and my mum must have told me he was down there somewhere um so yeah I remember that in, in terms of the flat we used to live in mm. um and then we we moved not that far away from there a place called uh Wheelie Castle yeah. which to be fair I, I really lived there then most of my um certainly my you know my school life and teenage life up until about 18 19 mm. um went to um uh, yeah primary Prince Thorpe junior school um then went to um well it was it, it was a Bartley Green girls school which is now called um Hillcrest um only purely because apparently they uh, began to have boys in the sixth form right. so it, it wasn't appropriate <laughs> to be called Bartley Green girls <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. um and it, and it, it was really interesting actually because I think a lot of people I knew went to um, a, a, another a school called um, Shenley Fields, which most people went to. It was like what you call the, I suppose, the feeder school. Mm. Um, but for some reason, I, I just liked the idea of Bartley Green Girls School. It had been all girls. I, I, don't ask me why. I can't really remember now. Mm. Um, and it, it used to be um, a grammar school. 
So although it wasn't a grammar school when I went, the the headmistress that used to still be the headmistress of the grammar school, she actually was still the head. And in fact, she was still the head up until my what I class as my fifth year, right. which is 7, 8, 9, 10. Nowadays, you'd call year um, 11. So it was only the last year of my, of my school in there that she left. And right. I suppose that's – I'm sharing that because that's quite important because um, – I felt that it still had, it probably still had quite a, a traditional feel, you know, she she was still the head. So even yeah. though on paper it was called a comprehensive, it felt like it still had some of the, you know, same ethos, um, yeah, some of the same, I suppose, traditions, morals and so forth. Yes. Um, and even down to some of the subjects that they still did, um, they did something called classical studies which was um, really looking at um, archaeology and it looked at Romans and Greeks and gods and mm. all that mythology type stuff, Homer, Odysseus, um, which I absolutely adored. Yeah. And I do recall leaving school with a, a number of qualifications. I did all right, actually, at school. Um, but the one I, I got an A in was my classical studies. Oh. So. Oh, <laughs> and that that yeah that love of of that classic side of things and the archaeology side of things as well I don't know it never never really sort of left me there's something about that that I felt you know I really grasped if you like mm. um and as I said and I, I left that school with um yeah about sort of four or five really good grades at O levels um a couple of CCSEs um and and I re- I actually was one of those people that I quite enjoyed school. To be fair, mm. um, yeah, I think being the eldest of four, and my mum and dad, particularly my mum, I think you know they 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 were quite strict in that you know you didn't really go out unless you had a purpose or a reason to. Yes. So um, I think for me, school was probably where I channeled a lot of my energy. Um, I I loved and still absolutely have a passion and a love for reading. Right. Um, and learning. So I, I yeah, I, I spent many, many of my teenage hours um, with my head in, in a lot of books. Um, yeah. Mm. <laughs> Well, it's, I mean, what, what sounds so fascinating, the classical studies that you did, I mean, a lot of that, of course, will be a lot of storytelling in there. Mm. There'll be mm. a lot of stories about, yeah. you know, the mythical, the myths and, and the gods and whatever. And mm. um, I think once you get into that, I think it's very... Uh, you become very curious to kind of go, well, what what were those times like, you know? Yeah. And were, were they different from the times that we live in today? I, personally, I don't think they are different, but, um, yeah. but yeah, fascinating. Well done. So um, so after you did all of the, that kind of schooling and, you yeah. know, got into reading and still had a love for that, what, what happened then after? Um. It's interesting, actually, because I, re- I do recall um, wanting to be, um, amongst probably other things I thought about, but I wanted to be an archaeologist. And okay. I remember speaking to them at the school, you know, the careers um, at the time, and I clearly remember them turning around and saying, um, you're, you're too young. And mm-hmm. at this point in time, there isn't really anything that you could, like a course as such, you know, you could go on to do right now. You'd have to wait till you're a bit older. And I was, yeah, really disappointed by that. Um, and I think, like a lot of t- things of its time, I do think that the careers advice probably wasn't necessarily the brilliant. You know, it wasn't yeah, as good as what it probably is nowadays. It isn't um, that brilliant now either. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I felt a little bit, oh, a bit l- sort of lost with that. And I'll be really honest with you. I remember one of my friends, Angela, saying, um, Oh man, why don't you come with me? I'm going. To, it really was. I'm going to Matthew Bowen College. Come and sign up. And I was like, Oh, um, okay. So I literally <laughs> went with her, 
Um, and thought about what, uh, you know, subjects I wanted to do. I loved English, was always, yeah, really loved the English side of things. So yes. um, took up my English, um, took up, <laughs> interestingly, took up economics, which I really didn't enjoy that much. And um, I also took psychology, which interestingly, if I recall now, I think I took it as a bit of a side subject. You know, I, I'm not convinced I really took it because I felt I knew, you know, I, that, that much about it. No. Um, and yet, ironically, it probably ended up being the one subject that really grabbed my attention and I yeah. really um, enjoyed. Mm. Um, and I think definitely started to give me that feel for, you know, thinking about people's minds and how the mind works and, um, the, yeah, just the whole psychology, really, of, of how, how we work, how we communicate. Yes. Um, but when I finished my studies there, to be again, like probably a lot of people, I, I wasn't quite 100% sure um, at the time what I really wanted to do. Mm. Um, and I do recall a, a period of time where I had a variety of, I'd, I worked in bar jobs. I remember um, working at TGI Fridays. I used to work on a knicker stall in the rag market. Um, <laughs> I yeah I, I I did lots of different things um also that that actually came after um I used to do um a paper round which was very important because I was the longest standing um paper girl that did um a paper round for about three years yes um so yeah I, I which says something actually about me because I think even then I was one of these people that I was a bit of a stayer so once I committed to something, I I really did. Do you know what I mean? I, I committed to it. Yeah, and I, great. I, yeah, I, I sort of stuck at it. So, um, so yeah, I had all these other various sort of, if you like, jobs at the time. And then, um, I, I, again, a, a care visiting role came up. And I think it was, again, if I recall, I think it was part of the YTS scheme of its time, which was going back. Yeah. And, um. It was uh, it was for a year contract, and it was literally going to visit um, a range of people um, in their own homes, mm. and you had all it, there was a variety of um, tasks that you you would have. So I remember one person she was um, blind and disabled, so her, uh, you know my role there was to um, go swimming with her. Mm. Um, there was um, there'd be another lady who needed um help with shopping so i'd go and visit her and then i'd go get the shopping come back and you know and, and part of that would be you know company and making a cup of tea and so forth um yeah. so it, yeah it, it was it was such a wide variety of people with a range of um a range of needs and i really really enjoyed that job i, I enjoyed i think i enjoyed the the caring aspect right but I also think I enjoyed the variety because literally no one person was the same and, and no one thing you were expected to do, you know, was the same. No. Um, except I suppose the commonality was um, providing company. Mm. Um, and, and also the team, I remember um, the, the other people that I worked with at the time. Um, yeah. we were, were really, just a really great team you know really connected really worked well together um had quite a a, a, a laugh real com you know camaraderie mm. um so I, I do remember that um and then um i'll tell you what i did actually was i i saw an advert um for mental health nursing in right. the local paper yeah and I, I don't ask me why. I mean, I, I, you know, <laughs> can't say I consciously thought this through. I no. saw this advert. I must have something must have grabbed me, and I remember thinking, "Oh, that sounds interesting." And I applied yeah. um, to do. Then it was you, you did like three year training, but you were on lots of placements as part of your training. Mm. So I remember applying, and I think I, I must have gone in with a sense of I wasn't really. I think if I didn't get it. Some, some, you know, I wasn't so attached to it. It wouldn't have mattered at the time, and 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 they they offered me a place, and I was like, oh, okay. I think I was sort of, 
you know, pleasantly surprised. Yes. And then I was actually um, then going to travel Europe with um, my best friend, who I still see and know now, Julie. And she'd just been offered um, a place doing a teacher training um, up in Leeds. Mm. So we literally, for the first time, we, we were planning to travel Europe. And at the same time, interestingly, we both had things, you know, being offered that we were um, coming back to do. Right. So we and we went and travelled for a few months, and then you know by the time we came back, we obviously both had these trainings that we've been accepted to do. Yes. Um, but I often think to myself, I don't know whether because the travelling just brought out you know a whole different world, and I hadn't really travelled up until that point, so I, I really see. felt yeah. It, I think it really it really opened my eyes up to to you know there's a whole different perspective a whole other world um and and i don't know whether i would have come back interestingly if i hadn't have had that to come back to if that makes <laughs> but two months is still quite a long time to go traveling isn't it um, I suppose so <laughs> yeah but did, yeah. was it just europe you did yes it, yes it, we did but we we did it a funny we we didn't go the u well so the usual way we we went from place to place to place and then we go oh we got we got we went back um what we did was we we traveled um a large part of italy yeah and went to florence and rome and venice and we'd just go where you know we we felt we wanted to go yeah so i remember the one day in venice we got off the train station and um we thought i know that there was quite a few people traveling but you know when you have a moment where you think something's not right here because there was so so many people mm. it was a bit unusual it was like there must be something else going on <laughs> and then we started to look and we saw people with t-shirts on and various merchandise and so forth we suddenly and we talked to a few other people and we realized that the reason there was all these people there was because they actually come to see pink floyd in concert oh my god and we sort of was like Oh, and I, if I remember right, I've got a vague memory. I think we were going to be going somewhere else. And we just went, oh, I think we need to stay then. So, <laughs> so we saw, like, Pink Floyd was, um, they were playing over the water. Yes. Um, so, you know, on like a platform sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so that was one of those moments where we were basically, it was so random. We, we stayed and we watched Pink Floyd, um, which you can imagine was just, you know, Oh my God, surreal! Yeah. Um, then we met these American Army guys who actually in, like on a base out there. Yeah. And so I'm just going and um, yeah, so making friends with them. This is me and Julie. This was, you know. So oh yeah, off you go and just make friends. And I remember us going to watch the cinema in this um, Army <laughs> American base. <laughs> um, and then honestly, when I look back, I'm like. And then we met these um, these Belgian guys on on route in Italy, mm. and um, they said, "Oh, we they were spend uh, traveling and spending a bit more time in particularly in Rome, which I mean, talk about ar- you know, talk about archaeology yes. and so forth." Me, yeah, Rome and Greece and so on. I was like, "Oh," so I was like really up for that. So I remember us. And I can't even believe we did it now. We crammed. There was four of us in this tiny, I, if I describe it, it's like a mini, because I'm sure that's somewhat how big it was. Um, we crammed four lots of backpacks and cases and all sorts of things into this car that was supposed to just be for these two um, Belgian guys. Yeah. And we all crammed in, and off we toddled. And we then um, were in Rome for two weeks, having <laughs> this of amazing experiences oh and that was where we went to um the vatican mm. and that was oh oh michael that was quite that was quite awe-inspiring actually mm. I, I do remember just yeah archaeology and big buildings and history and just walking into this immense amazing place and yeah just feeling quite inspired and uh, i'm I'm sure, you know, walking around with my mouth probably open, you know, <laughs> for most of that time. So it's really interesting. I'm sharing this with you and I'm just thinking it's really fascinating how I'm thinking there about the connection, you know, with history and stories and and, and just, oh, yeah, archaeology and yeah. just 
yeah, there's, there's something about that that just was quite um, quite amazing, really. Um, sounds amazing. I mean, it sounds like you you trusted, you just trusted, you know, to be taken to the right place and just allowed yourself to be carried in the moment yeah. of what was happening without being over planned not really knowing exactly where you were going to be from one week to the next but you just allowed it to happen which is an amazing place to be quite honestly it is and and it is and what's really fascinating when i think about it is i think you know it's like really i mean when i think about my my business and my work now and so forth i mean it's so <laughs> i've got to say, it's so planned michael i have you know, for me to be able to do all the amazing, wonderful variety of things I do, what struck me then was, yeah, I've got, um, I've, I have a big A4 file effects diary. I still like the traditional, you know, physical paper stuff. Yeah. But that's, that's interesting. It's, it's, a, there's a lot of planned stuff in there. Of so course. I do, it yeah. When you said that, I think, um, yeah, I, I think sometimes I just need to put in a, 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 a gap a day yeah. but let's see what happens <laughs> let's just see what happens absolutely yeah trying to mm. trusting the process i suppose mm. and it sounded like you did that i mean obviously you were younger and and also you know we're taught now that we've got to have these goals and plan for these goals and take action to move mm. towards them and this that, and the other but Sometimes it just pays to allow things to unfold as they should be. Like, yeah, I agree with that. And you know, the, the, the interesting thing about that is that although my I have quite, um, if you like, a, a focus on the work I'm doing and what I do, and the yeah, I do, the variety of things that I do. At the same time, I'm thinking about it now, and I'm, I'm probably jumping ahead a bit with with. You know, That's my fine. story, but I am mindful that I don't really think um, there was a. I had a plan of sorts, but I wouldn't say to you it was a conscious right. My path, my path. You with me? Is that I'm now going to do this, this, and this, and I'm now going to do this, this, and this. So I've, I've, with a lot of the things I have done, I can sort of share about and talk about. I think. Um, I've allowed some of those things to just develop mm. and then I've I've definitely when the time has felt right of a work has developed and 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 emerged and I've made certain decisions mm. that's definitely felt the right felt right at the time. Yes. Um so I think I have allowed my my work to develop and 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 more. Mm. Um, Very good. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. So anyway, you were you went on your travels for two months, yes. had that amazing kind of synchronicity of experiences. Yes. And then came back to the UK, then yep. went straight into that into yeah. that role, <laughs> into that job. Yeah, the three my so three years training to be a mental health nurse. Yeah. Um which was the best thing I ever did, you know. I I, I mean, when I look back, I think I wasn't to know that I, I was, you know, it was going to work. I was going to enjoy it, um, mm. but I really, really loved it. You know, the the different placements, the different range of people I was working with, um, the learning that came from it, um, the stretch. I say the stretch, you know, as in, you know, you could be on a placement, for example, working with um, elderly people who've got mental illnesses, which may include somebody, say, who's got a mental illness and a form of, say, Alzheimer's. Yes. Um, and then I'd be on an, another placement, say, for about three months or so, where I was working with adults um, uh, going through addictions. Mm -hmm. um, then there, were, there was another placement where um, I was working with um, – that was a, an acute inpatient unit, so more for – Adults who'd been sectioned um, with a range of, you know, quite severe yeah. mental health um, problems. Yes. Um, it could be schizophrenia, manic depression and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and then I remember there was another placement where 
I was actually working in the community. Um, so this was more enabling people to live and function, if you like, you know, as much as, you, you know, the, the, you, they were able to in their own homes. So you were actually going and visiting them um, in their own homes and, yes. and trying to support them in, in maintaining their mental well-being. Um, and I and I met um, my, my friend Lorna, who, yeah, we became <laughs> inseparable. Mm. And um, she was a big part of that experience. Um, and in fact, although um, I sort of seen her for a number of years, and then like I think sometimes happens in life. I mean, I do try and stay connected to a lot of people that matter to me, but sometimes you know it, it doesn't always. Um, it, you don't always see those people as much as what you think you might. Correct. Um, yeah. But actually, it was I haven't seen her and spoken to her in probably a number of years, and then a couple of years ago, um, I'd sort of you know, got in touch with her and rung her and, and we'd started speaking again a lot more. Um, and in fact, I went down um, a sort of Brighton way um, to stay with her. Um, and it, it was lovely. It was a real reconnecting, mm. you know I mean, of, of, yeah, friendship and this, this yeah, sort of spirit of, of what I remember. Um, mm. And I still, you know, I, I, we still keep in touch. Um, so, yeah, the, I think there's something about, um, even within the work, there's something about the relationships, I think, that I have also, um, you know, connected with and, and developed over certain periods of time um, that I think have, have been equally as important as the work itself yeah. is actually the relationships I've developed from them as well. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Mm. And so the the, I mean, dealing with people – that are in serious mental health conditions or labelled with mm. quote unquote mental health issues must have been challenging when you you know I mean you said you enjoyed the job but there must have been challenges in dealing with that in terms of seeing the pain as well in people. Um, that's interesting. Um, I'm pausing because. It's hard. Sometimes when you, you know, and you're trying to think back and look back and, and you're trying to remember, you know, certain aspects of, I suppose, of the work then. Um, and, and I do think and it's the same, you know, with, with, with some of the work I've even done up until recently. Um, I think that I sort of just had this ability or capacity to see a person for, for for being a person so I don't know I, I seem to always have this ability to be able to try and connect with somebody on a human fundamental level and really not get too caught up if that if this makes sense with the um with the illness or the you know the the diagnosis or or the the I don't know even the the, the stories, let's say, you know, that might come along if, with somebody. If somebody's been, say, somewhere like All Saints, which was where I did my training, these were quite long-standing, you know, mental health hospitals of, of their time. And I think um, when I was doing my training there, um, there would have been a number of, of to use the term, patients that had probably also been there for a period of time Mm -hmm. Some of what I call the more long term um patients. Yeah. Um so I suppose the reason I'm saying that is because, you know, some people, some patients would um have stories, shall I say, you yeah. know, their his their history mm -hmm. that's or that that comes with them. Some some, you know, may be very valid and, and, and others I'm not quite sure is always that helpful if you're trying to see beyond the label. Yes. Um, and the history and you know the, the, the someone else's story um so yeah i, I the, the, i'm sure there are challenges that come with it but i i don't know i just didn't really i didn't i, I seem to just be able to look beyond that to be honest um where did that and, ability come from did that come from your education or just your interest in people 
I mean, do you know, I that's a really <laughs> yeah. It's, no, it's a really good question. You know, when you've done you've done work for such a long, you know, working with people. Yes. Um, you know, I've really worked with people in terms of you know the type of, of jobs I've done all my life. So I, I sometimes really do have to think like must to myself. Well, you know, is that is it learned? Is it developed over time? You know, is it through other reasons? Mm. Um, I think even when I was younger, I think I, I don't know. I, th- I think I always was quite, I was quite caring. Right. Um, but I think I was also quite sensitive as well. And I, it's really interesting because when I, my, you know, we all have different memories of when we're, we're younger. I remember um, at times, been sort of told perhaps I was a bit too sensitive which used to really annoy me and bug me because I think I started to see that as almost like um a bit of a weakness right um yeah and but actually as I've you know developed in my work and my life and and grown in many ways I've really I've come to accept that I think this this sensitive side, if if you like, mm. um, I think is also, I think it means I've got quite a lot of um, empathy and compassion. I think I feel for people. Right. Um, I have the ability to feel and connect with people quite quickly. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I also I think I have the ability to be able to to not get caught up in somebody else's if you like stuff so that you're not able to to help enough you know i think you need to also have some um some objectivity um a little bit of um distance so that you're not you know emotionally um yeah merging with another person or you know your stuff and somebody else's stuff is merging um so i I do think i've i've i think I've, i've perhaps learned to do that over time as well but i think i do have a a capacity if you like to be able to to hold i think um I, i'm the eldest of four so i think there is an element of um a certain role you step into yeah if you're the eldest you know i, I definitely remember you know I, I i was told that i needed to be you set an example was the phrase you know mm-hmm. remember, set an example you do have that sense of um of being the responsible one um which i think has definitely you know, uh, yeah, as, as sort of stayed with me. Yeah. Um, that sense of, um, yeah, responsibility, um, I think is quite, quite a key part of me and my work and, you know, and how seriously I suppose I, I do take things. Um, I'm just, yeah. I, yeah I think all thank, the, no, that's, that's that great. One. I mean, it's, it's not a trick question. It was just... <laughs> I was just curious, really, to see how you managed to develop such a skill. And I think the key word you mentioned there is empathy. You know, Mm. so being the eldest in the family and having three other siblings that you have to set an example for, but you also have to manage them from time to time. You know, Mm. you just don't know how skills develop, do you, over time? I mean... You obviously did a caring job for a while, so you developed a yeah. skill in that. You obviously yeah. did psychology, so yeah. you got an insight into people's minds. So all of these things, you're well read, you enjoy reading, so you learn about people yeah. through reading. You you know, all the classical studies, yeah. all of these things contributed, I think, in terms mm. of developing you to be ready, mm. to be ready to spend time with people that are vulnerable in difficult places, being able to yeah. keep a level head and keeping your distance, not getting involved in their stuff um, yeah. and and providing some sense of, you know, empathy, but also support. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I, mm-hmm. I think it. listening to the story, I can understand how it's all developed. It, it sounds incredible. It sounds very, yeah. very interesting. Um, great. I think I also, sorry, Mark, I was going to say, I think, um, another big part of, um, of my, I said my upbringing, um, 
is um but it it, mom, it wasn't through my mum and dad um i i went to um church from when i was about age 7 i went to like a sunday school basically i was you know one day i was invited yes. by friends and it was a case of oh somewhere to go on a sunday um mum and dad were probably ecstatic because it was about probably the only couple of hours they they had without <laughs> children around mm. um so I, I literally went to this Sunday school from when I was about age seven and I yeah. started to take my other brother and sister with me at the time. My other, my other younger brother wasn't with us then. Um, and I, and I basically, uh, that was quite a big part of my life. Actually. I, I went to church, um, on and off at that particular church cause I was Sunday school teacher. And then me and my friend Julie were involved in the youth group, um, at, at one point, even when I then left there and did my other work, um, I remember going to, um, in fact, a church not far from where I did the, the psychiatric nurse training. And then even when I um, moved over to more uh, sort of Starbridge ends and I I'd, um, had my daughter at the time um, looking for like, um, like a, 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 a crash type uh, thing. Yeah. And it was actually the local church again that happened to have um the a, a, a sort of a you know crash type facility yes um so th- that connection came again and i think that even though as a, as uh, yeah as an adult i mean that's a, this and i say it's another conversation itself i think that my my um faith as i would call it um i think has been an interesting one because I think I've sort of over time, I've gone from taking all this stuff on board when I was younger and 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 really saying to people, you know, what I believed in very strongly, mm. to then going into adulthood and having my daughter and 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 all these other life experiences and actually um, questioning a lot more. And I do recall going through a process where I. I felt actually um, I was quite, I think, quite, shall I say, guilty for questioning and doubting what I really believed in and yeah. question whether I really um, had had um, a faith. And, and and even to this day now, although I would say um, it has really, you know, it has influenced me in a, in a lot of ways, I think I I still have question marks in relation to um, – yeah, to faith and God and what I really believe in, I think. But but now, I think I'm in a place where I'm okay to be able to say, I I question, yeah. <laughs> as opposed to feeling awful because I'm questioning. If that makes sense. Mm. Um, particularly, yeah, when yeah when you've grown up in in a church and from when you're little and you're you're um encouraged to believe in certain things i think you know i think that's the piece i think to then get into adulthood and suddenly start to question it for yourself not because somebody's telling you this is what you should believe in um i think is is yeah a, a bit of a a journey a personal journey i, I completely I understand what you're going through because the same happened to me I mean, I when I was in the Netherlands, I had to go into. Uh, I was brought up Catholic in yeah. Amsterdam, and I had to go to morning, very very early morning mass as an altar boy. Mm. And my mother took me like five o'clock in the morning for I, I, I did, you know got me up at five o'clock or earlier to go for I don't know five thirty or six a.m. Uh, mass, and well, it wasn't mass; it was like in a you know, tiny little chapel, and I had to ring the bell uh, for the for the priest when he was, you know, serving up some wine for himself at six o'clock in the morning, <laughs> and and getting drunk and keep drinking it, you know, and and I was like falling asleep having to ring the bell at the appropriate moment, and I have to admit I I forgot a couple of times <laughs> to do it, <laughs> um, but yeah, though that seems like. Such a long time ago now, but yeah, I, you, I mean, it would be a totally separate podcast that we could talk about, you know, beliefs and and faith and things like that, um, because my my mind has has gone all over the place over the years with that for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
And well, as you said, maybe there's another podcast in there. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, I think so, definitely. Um, okay, so so mental health nurse is where we got to. You, yeah, you did that for a while. Yeah, well, and then so when I I qualified, um, I I I knew like almost immediately that the one thing I had not trained for was to basically be controlling and restraining um, patients on on the wards. I just knew that I couldn't do that. And there was a part of me that just felt I'd trained, you know, to what I call, you know, help people. And for me, the idea of of part of a job being controlling and restraining somebody basically from, you know, getting out the door because they're on a section – I was just like, no, nah, I, I, I just, no, I'm not going to do that. No. So quite quickly, um, I actually um, started to look for what I call community work. Um, so working in the community, um, you know, rehabilitation um, type work. Mm-hmm. But at, what sort of had, had happened just slightly prior to this a little thing is um, I'd sort of um, met my then well it became my husband much later on but um met um the the father of, of our daughter Kaylee yeah. and um I then had um I, I had Kaylee and within the early stages of the first couple of months I knew quite clearly that I actually wanted um to continue working um and and I really felt that you know all my skills that I'd um, trained for I really wanted to still be able to use them mm-hmm. and so very early on um I when Kaylee was only about three or four months old um I applied for this it was actually um it was it was in still all still in mental health nursing but it was in a rehabilitation unit right uh, through what was then focus housing and it was um for adults with mental health um issues but they would come and stay um, anything between uh, sort of six months to perhaps two years, and the idea was that you were um, enabling them to develop um, basically, you know, independent living and social skills yes. to be able to support them to to live in, in, in whether it be independently or you know sort of supported housing. Um, and so I did that for about three or four years, and what I what I found within that role as well was I really, really loved the teaching side of things. And I would be the first to be, you know, saying to the manager, oh, I'll, I'll do groups on this, I'll do groups on that, I'll, um, you know, do some teaching with the staff around this, that and the other. Mm. Um, to which, I mean, if you've got a good manager and you've got somebody like me going, I'll do this, I'll do that, you know, he, he, he must have thought, yeah, you know, this is fantastic. So he would generally go, yeah, man, that's great. You know, you do it and get on with it. and. Um, on the back of that, I actually remember um, doing my certificate in education, which was in um, FE, and and also combining that with my sort of clinical nursing and assessing skills. You could do a course at the time, which basically gave you a certificate of education in ad- working with adults, but you could also combine, um, there was like a, a clinical nursing and assessors um, award. So I remember um, doing that. But again, coming back to this, you know, I've always, I have just I love learning, Michael. I, I just, yeah, I've always loved that. So um, I did a certificate in education. And after about three or four years, um, I was just considering I wanted to do some more creative work. Right. Something about the creative side that started to come up for me. Yes. And um, I found... Um, this, uh, it was actually um, a disability arch train at the time, but the woman who ran that then said, oh, you know, there's these other types of courses that, that you can do that's, you know, much more progressive. And there was uh, drama therapy, art therapy and so on. So I'd looked to apply for, to qualify and do drama therapy. Um, and at the same time, I had seen a job come up at, it was actually at Samuel College, but it was quite different because the job was to be a tutor, but it was actually teaching um, students who've got mental health needs. Right. Um, and it was quite progressive because of its time. Um, most of the, the people with the mental health um, 
issues were um, still community based. A large number, let's say, attended, um, for example, day centres. And what the college were looking to do was to try and develop this provision within the college itself and also bring more of the learners um, to, to actually do more courses in the college. So it was quite a, it was an interesting piece for, I think, some of the, the clients as well, because you were really trying to um, enable them yes. to come independently into a college. And if you like, all of a sudden, you're given, talking about labels, well, to have the label of a student or a learner versus um, I'm somebody, you know, who, who goes to a day centre because I've got schizophrenia or manic depression or anxiety or, or so forth. I think for some of those um, learners, those clients, that was quite um, empowering, yeah. you know. It yeah. was almost like the, the way I think it, a lot of people would feel, it was. it, it felt like... Um, Oh, because I'm coming to this college, somehow it, it, it normalises things. You know, I, I'm like everybody else. It had that sort of feel about it. Mm. Um, and so I'd applied for this post and, and got it. Um, and so I then started to um, deliver courses both in the community but developing this provision so that learners with mental health needs could actually progress into the college itself. Right. Um, and that was, I mean, I, that was massive. You know, I love that. Again, I was teaching, but I was still doing personal development. Um, a lot of those courses, you know, were, were very much along the lines of um, helping people to manage stress, um, to manage their own anxieties, um, to, to, you know, look at their own mental health, um, assertiveness, you know, building up confidence. Um, and while I was there, I'd, I'd ask them if they would fund for me to um, do the drama therapy um, mm. training as well. Okay. Which, yeah. So they they then funded me to do – that was part-time, basically one day a week. So I'd be um, up and down um, to London. It was actually Hatfield, uh, one day a week doing my drama therapy training and having, um, uh, having to attend personal therapy, group therapy, placements – for the work because there was a you know a large part of, of all that that in was entailed with the drama therapy yeah um and so started to develop um not just the work within the college what's really interesting here michael is i think this was where i actually started to have people coming to this was before i i even developed my own business people were coming to me very naturally and saying oh you know, would could, would you do this? Would you do that for us? I've seen, you know, organisations and projects. Right. But they they wanted what I had to offer. They actually didn't really want to come through the college. That's not what they were asking. And, and so I think there was a process where for a period of time I was having to try and, you know, yeah, trying to sort of configure that in my own mind about, well, you know, what does this look like? Um, do I have the capacity, you know, to be able to sort of do work outside of uh, my work at the college, which was, a, you know, a full-time post. Mm. Um, and and along the same sort of times where I said things just developed, I didn't sit down one day and <laughs> went, no, I'm going to do this. Then I'm going to do the drama therapy, then I'm going to do. Amazing. I had a friend who um, was getting into the coaching and – She'd actually done some of her training with CTI, which was the, the original people I trained with. And, and it was one of those probably conversations that hundreds of coaches, you know, would be familiar with where she turned around and said to me, man, I've just like, I've met this woman and um, done this, you know, been doing this training and it's around this coaching. Oh, I've got to tell you, not only is it amazing, it's so you. I'm telling you, you would uh, love it. Honestly, you you uh, you go and look into <laughs> go look into this. Oh um, and you know how it turned out, right? Was I looked into this training that that this they did, and I thought to myself, oh, actually, what would be good is for me to understand more about how this works. And I ended up um, taking on this a, a co not my friend, another person she knew who was trained in CTI coaching. Um, I took her on as my coach for me to experience, like, what was this coaching thing about? Right. And so I had 
So I had, yeah, so I, I had personal coaching that I paid for, mm. for this coach and really, you know, started to think about my own work and my life. And, and, and I think that's where the business element of things started to show up. Right. Um, and then from that experience, I decided, you know what, I want to try this, this training stuff yeah. and, you know, the coaching. Um, and I went for um, their introductory uh, three-day weekend and was just I, I was blown away by them actually yeah. um and i'll tell you what really struck me was not only feeling quite i felt at home i felt like it was right but i also um was pretty gobsmacked at the the learning the stretch and the awareness that came from it because i think what struck me was i'd done the mental health nursing I've done a lot of work around as well with, with having supervision. Um, I then done the uh, you know the drama therapy training, which had required yeah. personal therapy and all sorts of other things. So you know it's about digging deep. Yes. And I think what really struck me was when I did this coach training or the, the initial weekend. I remember th- thinking, "Wow, hang on a minute. Well, this isn't therapy, but actually, this is you know just taking me to a place very quickly." that I just knew, uh, you know, really sort of, we're just going to ramp ramp things up a gear for me is, is I think, the only way to describe it. Mm. Um, and so from that point, I then um, went on all their other, there was about, the, the way they did their training, there was different themes around balance, process, fulfillment, and they were each like these three days at a time. And then you'd basically have, um, you know, say a month or so in between, you know, you do homework and various other things. And then you go back, you know, and do your next three days. Mm. And quite quickly in that process, I, I knew, realized quite quickly that I wanted to develop my coaching practice as part of, of you know, what I was wanting to do. Right. And I was quickly um, building up. Yeah, I was getting people who... I knew and we're like man you know we, we really want to have some coaching from you I want to know more about this yes and I, I got to a point where I knew that something had to give mm. so I went to the college and I thought I ain't got anything to lose here really and I said to them um would you consider allowing me to go part-time because I want to develop my own work and my own business um and they basically said yeah you know, in, in a nutshell, to be honest, Michael, at the time, mm. I'd always had fantastic managers. That were, and, and my manager at the time just turned around and went, man, um, we really, you know, we, we value who you are, you know, what you do and what you're about. And to be frank, we don't really want to lose you. Mm. So, yes, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, at least that way, they're still keeping me. That's right. Very sensible. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so that's what I did. I went part time there started to really that was where I really developed a large part of um, my um, sort of and it really is it's coaching training therapy and supervision that there are there's four arms you know to, to my business that's developed over time but that's where in relation to the coaching and me having a coach um, I actually created the name as well so the notion of no limits right it's like they're on the one hand, it, I, I love working with parody and and irony, and I think that's I think that the drama therapy works really well with that. Yes. So the idea of no limits is you need to know your limits, and <laughs> there are no limits. Yes. Now they, they, there's you know it's like uh, and that's why in my no limits as in K N O W, but there's a highlight on the N and the O in the no limits. So there are no limits and mm, you also need to know your limits as well. So there's a, yeah, the, the, there's a, um, and, and I always believe, I think there's a learning for ourselves within, you know, for example, I, I created that name for the business, but I also think that's a big part of who I am. Yeah. What I'm at and what I'm continuing to learn, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. But for me, um, as as an individual, as a person, as a as a business owner, as a as a friend, as, as all sorts of things, really. Um, and so, I I carried on doing part time, um, and then again, I just 
Michael, and it was probably only about another year, if I'm honest, I got to a point where I absolutely loved, I loved the work I was doing at the college. So I never, ever left because I didn't enjoy the work. Um, I actually ended up leaving because I didn't feel it was so much of a challenge for me anymore. Right. And, and actually to develop my own business, for me, was that was the challenge, you know, the stretch. Um, in that moment in time but what I had done and, and I'll be really you know quite upfront about this I wasn't the, I wasn't the person that went oh I'm just gonna you know jump into it and and see how it goes and and I've not really um built up or done anything to create that foundation so what I'm saying is you know in terms of me developing my business I had spent a couple of years building stuff up, creating, um, you know, pieces of work, people getting to know me. Um, I was doing a lot more coaching training as well. So I did the original coach training. I then did what they call their certification process, which is about another six to 12 months. Um, so I can coach other coaches. I also um, did my um, parents and teen coach training for about another year. And then I also did what I'd call, um, it's ORSC, it's the Organisational Relationship Systems Coaching. And I did that for about another year as well. So I I did, do you know what I mean? I, I really sort of immersed yes. myself in, in different strands, if you like, of the mm. coach. Um, so, yeah, I think even then, I, I definitely, um, you know, I, I was, if you like, I, I was taking graded what I'd call, you know, graded gradual risks. Um, because ultimately, um, you know, and by that point I was, you know, I I had Kaylee, I was married, um, we had um a home, a mortgage. So I yeah, I I wasn't in a position, shall I say, where um I could have you know, I was gonna turn around and say, Oh yeah, by the way, I'm gonna just I'm gonna give that up, you with me, and just jump in here blindly and Let's see how it develops. Um, I, I definitely built some some foundation stones, so to speak, mm. uh, before I um, before I left the college um, at Samwell and and you know took on the business full time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, ah. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant. And, and that has just really. I mean, this is this is now what. Whew, 15, 16, 20 years. I mean, 20 years. I, I lose track actually with the timing because mm. it's just, it, it's, it's just, um, where can I put it? It's, it's become a creation in itself. And I think the work has morphed over time. Mm. So, you know, I, I, there was a period of time where I was doing a lot, a lot of work with, um, young people, primary, secondary age and parents. Yes. Then the work morphed so that I was then doing more work with um, practitioners, I mean, who are working with young people um, to enable them to understand, you know, how to work more creatively, um, and particularly with groups, because I've done quite a lot of group work, which, you know, is a skill in itself, as well as um, individual work. Um, I all, oh, and I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I also got that. Um, Amidst all that, st- all that stuff, um, I actually also went back. That's right. I, I forgot about that. I went back to I went to Birmingham Uni while I'm still doing all my other work, um, because I actually went back to get um, my a, a degree. It was in my BSc honours. It was still in mental health, but I actually decided to do a pathway on child and adolescent psychiatry. Right. Um, so what I then ended up with is if you like, two strands. So I have and had the skill and the experience of working with adults, but I also have and had the skill of working, you know, with with young people as well. Mm. Um, so I think that, that sort of creates quite um, a rich base. Um, and I think I also bring, I think I bring a lot of my skills to the table that, like, I know when I'm coaching, for example, that I'm coaching. Um, when I'm, if, if I'm say offering somebody therapy, I'm quite clear it's, it's, it's therapy. Yes. Um, if I'm offering somebody, um, supervision, 
based around I, I supervise therapists and coaches. Um, so I could be supervising a practitioner around um, their work, their, their clinical work. Mm. Um, I could be supervising a coach around them developing their business. And I, I'm quite clear. I'm quite clear of my boundaries. I'm quite clear that although I can, um, I've got different skills, you know, that, yeah. that I can draw upon. Um, I also know where that line's drawn. Um, yeah, that's quite, it's quite an interesting, quite interesting it, piece. Yeah, but. because it's easy, I think, <laughs> I suspect. I'm not a qualified coach and I have supported people, but there is a very fine line between giving, you know, therapy and kind of coaching because if i mean it's a skill in itself for you to be able to draw the line and not have the two kind of blend mm. into each other mm. uh in some way so yeah that's it's difficult i think i suspect it's difficult um to be able to make that distinction and to know you know what your there has to be an element of discipline, hasn't there, to be able to know, yeah, yeah. I'm coaching at the moment, I'm not giving therapy. Yeah. Um Yeah, I definitely agree with you. I think that I think the discipline and the and the, the self awareness and the self management are quite key. Mm. Um again, they're, they're skills I suppose I've developed over over a period of time. Um I think as well though, I think it's also what I'd probably find is the I think the depth, say for example with the coaching, I think the depth and the range of the emotional elements that I would probably go to and that somebody would probably be attracted to me, if that makes sense, for, for knowing, you know, the, I suppose my, my other stuff I bring to the table, um, I think means that there's probably a broader range, if that makes sense, of um, the perhaps the emotional content that somebody might bring um, to the coaching, and I would be, um, I'd be happy to explore, knowing that it's still coaching and not therapy. Mm. Um, mm. But yeah, um, and, and what's making me smile here is I'm, I'm just sitting here thinking to myself, "Oh, that's another podcast in itself, Michael." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the topic is so huge, and. I'm sure, I mean, you've been doing this for a while and I was going to ask, I've got loads of questions, follow-up questions to ask you, but I, I didn't want to interrupt your flow. But what, I mean, you're working with young adults, young people, adults. You've been doing it for a while, um, yeah. you know, for 20-odd years. Mm. So my, my burning question is, Ooh, have cool. things got better? or worse in the human drama called mental health and what is going on in in you know society today do do you think there's there's a bigger problem because i mean i i can't remember where it was but i mean mental health is supposed to by year 20 if you believe the stats 21 yeah. or 22 is supposed to be the biggest dis-ease in people um, yeah. overtaking heart disease, you know. Mm -hmm. um, where do you think it's going? And and the follow and okay, now I have a follow-up question to that as well. So over to you. Where where is it today? What's your view? Um, my view, um, based on, I can my view at the moment is based on um, you know where I've come from in terms of. The training and so, so my, um, you know, experience in in the, the the lifetime of you know the mental health sort of feel for yes. want of a better term. Yes. And so, a couple of things I I've noticed. So, I have certainly noticed, and 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 I would say definitely over the last couple of years that the awareness, the range of. Um, if you like, you know, uh, resources, support that is on offer. The um, the openness, I think, of um, 
society mm-hmm. and uh, generally has become way more accepting of um of of yeah you know some of somebody you know sort of sharing that they have um a, a range of you know mental health issues you know in its broadest sense i just think that's way more accepting now i think um some of that is down to media and press coverage some of that you know i think is also down to um you know the the younger royals that that you know have, have got involved um some of the big names within um you know the 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 uh, the, the what you call it? you know the stars you know what i mean so yeah even the royals um, yeah, yeah yeah so I, I think um i think there's been a lot of good if you like good stuff that i think her, you know has been developed um has begun to um it's, change yeah it's reducing um, think, the stigma yeah it's reducing the stigma Redu- i, I wouldn't say it's removed it yet but certainly oh, no, reduced it yeah yeah um so i think it's it, i think it's reduced in comparison to to certainly where where i saw it you know mm. when i was sort of say you know early 20s and, uh, and onwards um however i think the um i think the actual oh, what am i looking for um i think the range of mental health issues i think the the you know the amount of of you know people that are um are struggling in, in various you know sort of forms i think the pressures of um certainly a lot you know a lot of social media you know i, mm. I know that's but i'm sure quite a bit but i think um you know the impact of social media and the pressures on on young people and adults um is is gigantic and i think um you know the likes of which to be frank has never been seen before because we've never been at a point in this world where um digital and social media has been where it's at you know so 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 much is seen it's public it's accessible um and although that can be a good thing to to enable help and support when it's needed um that as we i'm sure we know you know can also in itself bring about a lot of um a lot of angst a lot of challenges um you know a lot uh, there's just so many other different pressures and then we've we've obviously got um all the stuff around our current climate um you know what impact that has on all of us but especially with younger people and then thinking about you know what's that mean for them and and their future Mm. and think gosh yeah you know that that's that's quite an enormous thing and i think you know that's absorbed and taken on board i think that can be um very difficult um Mm. for both you know adults and young people to be able to um to to yeah grasp and, and and make some um sense of and and continue to to live a purposeful and calm (laughs) yeah um you know stress-free life because i just think that yeah there's there's so much going on in the world um that has never that that really we've never seen the likes of before you know in in a very different way to how it has been before really Mm, mm. um Uh, yeah because i mean we could be kind of you know, going, oh, it's really bad, you know, mental health has got worse. But I think the point you're making is, A, there's more awareness now, B, there's a le- reduced amount of stigma, but there still is stigma. The yeah. And because we are a bit freer, openly talking and discussing about it, including the media, bad, worse or indifferent it is, um, it has a lot. I mean, as we know, we're talking here on the the Monday after the weekend where Caroline Flack taken her own life. I was life. just thinking that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you know, the media plays a massive role in that, but also the public does because of their appetite for celebrity yeah. gossip. You know. Yeah, uh, and yeah. and all the newspapers are doing is saying, "Well, you guys are reading it, therefore we're serving it up to you," you know, type of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. But then, um, because there's so much more awareness, it does look like it's got worse. 
but maybe because mm. we're talking about it more, I don't know. But then equally, there are more support services available. I know the NHS are nowhere near. I heard a statistic last week that says said that um, something like 50% of young people have got mental health issues and we've got only like, I don't know, 10% or less, 5%, I can't mm -hmm. remember. It was under 10% in terms of mental health services available, you know. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so we've got a massive gap in terms of, in terms of that stuff. Uh, mm. I, ha I haven't got the answer. I'm just kind of throwing it out there to our listeners to a certain degree. We'd love to know their comments. You know, please send us your mm. your comments and views on it all, because it's it's a problem. I mean, people like you, um, you know, there are loads. There are a lot of coaches out there that can help people, but they don't come for free. Yeah. You know, people have got to pay for it, yeah. uh, and not yeah. everybody has the money to be able to do that. So therefore, you know, I believe government, NHS, whatever, needs to provide the funding in order for people to access services outside of the NHS uh, because there's such experienced people like yourself available for people to help them. And some yeah. of it can be done relatively in a short period of time as well, you know, once people know. Yeah. Um, some of the things that you know in terms of how the mind works and how people can overcome it. So yeah. I, I do agree. This is a whole other podcast again um, <laughs> because it's a fascinating topic to me as well. My wife, mm -hmm. who's a coach as well. So, you know, we're, we're fascinated by what's going on in the world and, and kind of observing the kind of human drama mm -hmm. unfolding in front of our eyes including our own dramas. You know, we, we've got our own stuff too uh, to deal with and, you know, kids and yeah. all of that. So, and, and no one is immune to it, but... No, they're not. And it's, it's interesting because I think I, I, I alluded, I didn't allude, I, I made reference to something right at the beginning when you said, how's your day been? And mm. um, I said, oh, I've, I've just come back from meeting with two of the coaches. And... Um, one of the things that I've been really involved in of late is um, creating um, – It's the, we've got a page which is actually around um, courageous coaching conversations around the coffee table. Mm. And there's myself and two of the coaches. And what we've been doing is we've started to really open up these, you know, conversations around, well, what, you know, what, what does that look like? What does it take to ask the courageous questions? What does that mean in your – you know your own life how do you go about doing that um and one of the things that we've started to do and we've and it's only just you know it's fairly newly formed is we've been um and we did one this morning we've been videoing um ourselves having very honest true conversations you know between the three of us about our own personal things that have happened and or a conversation between us that maybe we you know in itself was courageous um, and then putting it out there to see, you know, obviously whether we can help people in that way and get, you know, people to share their own experiences. Um, and that's something that is just evolving and developing and really sort of hoping we've got a lot of, you know, interest and traction in that. So I'm really hoping that we can um, offer more help and support and, and resources, um, whatever that looks like you know, sort of yes. workshops, um, yeah, seminars and all sorts. But it's just interesting that that focus is particularly on um, the courageous um, conversations that are required in in life, in, 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 you know, in life every single day. Mm. Um, I think for all of us at some point, you know, there's an opportunity to, whether it be with, you know, she said, you know, your wife or a partner or, your, you know, son, daughter, work colleague, um, often we know something needs to be said um, to clear something, you know, or, or we um, something doesn't feel quite right or, you know, we, there's been some sort of miscommunication perhaps. Mm. Mm. And the actual being able to, to name it and bring it out into the open, I, I think in itself is um, 
is is courageous actually you know in itself yeah yeah i i um i'm gonna ask you where people can get all of that information in a minute but i just want to read out a quote i found the other day and i added to my linkedin profile which yeah. was by alan rickman of all people oh wow okay yeah he says the more we're governed by idiots and have no control over our destinies the yeah. more we need to tell stories to each other about who we are why we are where we come from and what might yeah. be possible yeah and it's alan rickman on the power of stories and mm. and what what you're sharing <laughs> is exactly that you're saying we're sitting round together and what you're doing is you're literally sharing stories that's what you're doing yeah about each other yeah. or about what might be possible for others as well and yeah sounds fascinating yeah. so so to share with us then mandy i i love this topic thank you so much but where can people find details about what you're doing, how can they get in touch with you? What social media channels can they find you on? Yeah. So um, my my website's www.nolimitscoach.com. That's no limits as in K N O W. Yeah. Um, my um, my email's Mandy at nolimitscoach.com. Um, I've then got some um, Facebook is facebook.com, but then it's actually uh, Mandy Gutzel. Because that's my surname, so some of the stuff is actually included in my surname as well. Yeah, including my Twitter dot com is Gutsel Mandy. That's yeah. G U T S E double L. And then again, LinkedIn um, has also got both my No Limits and it's got Mandy Gutsel. So, you know, if people are not sure, then either the, the No Limits itself um, and Mandy Gutsel will definitely bring stuff up. The Gutsel is quite unusual. Yes, it um, is very unusual. As, as, yeah, yes, a sort of surname as well. Fantastic. Um, well, so I'll... Those, those in themselves. Cool. That's great. Like, go go oh. on. <laughs> go on. No, no, go on. <laughs> <laughs> I will include those details in the show notes is what I was going to say <laughs> anyway. So they'll be able to find you and uh, so people can just click through on the links. It'll be really easy to get to you. And what about these videos? Where are you putting those up? So that's actually um, if, if people just put in courageous coaching conversations around the coffee table, um, that's actually they'll find that on Facebook. Um, if that actually comes to my Facebook page, the Courageous Conversations is also a link from there as well. Okay, great. Okay, are you posting these on Facebook then? Um, yes. 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 Okay, yes. fantastic. Okay. Yeah. Fabulous. Just, yeah, thank you. <laughs> sounds really, really good. Okay. So I, thank you so much for your time today. I really, really appreciate it. And... Yeah. Uh, well, last time we met at some Fiverr event in Birmingham, so I'm sure we'll meet again at another yeah. event. Um, we will. And I look forward to to it, Mandy. Success with everything you're doing for people Thanks. out in yeah. the world. I, I love what you're doing, and, and I'm cheering you on, saying, go, Mandy. Yeah, <laughs> help these people get over their stuff. And oh, thank you. And find their purpose in life. And... Um, I'm sure we'll see each other very soon. I'm sure we will. Thank you, Michael, for your time as well. You're very welcome. Take care. Bye for now. And you. Bye. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. 